Hello, everyone. Welcome to John Shaw's book trailer on rethinking education in the age of technology, the digital revolution and schooling in America. Second edition by Alan Collins and Richard Halverson. So this trailer is going to give an overview of the book and my thoughts on it in concert with my paper submission, which you'll be able to access in our Canvas shell. So thank you for joining me today. First thing, I'd like to go ahead and share the screen. My slideshow. OK, so rethinking education and the age of technology. Uh, first of all, this book came out in 2018 as a second edition. And I feel that it's a very good foundational start to where technology and education intersect and combine and work together in our new era of, of learning. In era three, which is lifelong learning, I'll get into that in a moment. One of the components of the book that I'd like to point out is that if it were written in the post COVID era, I feel that a lot of the assumptions and ideas that the authors had were would be now in just full throttle with the emergency remote teaching mode that many of us um, have found ourselves in. There's definitely um, some great takeaways in the book and some social justice pieces which have to do mostly with access as well as some educational history components. So let's go ahead and dive in. All right, so how education is changing. Um, you know, people are taking their education out of schools and into homes, libraries, cafes, and workplaces where they decide what they want to learn, when they want to learn, and how they want to learn. And one of the main tenets that the authors propose is that schools stay physical buildings, but they're rethought to be more supportive of all aspects of technology, as I just um, let you know about regarding access um, in people's own individualized studies. Um, so additionally, uh, Part of that problem with um, schools, as we all know here in Colorado and America, is funding. Uh, the authors mentioned that it's a challenge to receive any sort of funding from the federal or state or local levels for schools, even having um, mill levies for um, prop, you know, property tax increases and things like that. So um, that's a concern of theirs is that funding is a challenge for those of us in education uh, because without funding there is inherently uh, equity piece that is missing uh, regarding access to uh, technology as well as well-trained teachers to um, incorporate that technology. Um, so these factors and additional ones preclude the new era slash revolution of education of the lifelong learning model. This model supports the uncoupling of learning and schooling via new learning alternatives such as homeschooling, video games, online learning, workplace learning, web communities, and distance education. So I feel that that is important and relevant. Um, however, I feel that most of the folks in this class are well versed in a lot of these concepts. OK, um, so basically. Um, uh, the authors talk a little bit about the history of education, so let's move towards that. There's basically three main eras of education in the United States. One is apprenticeship, two is schooling, uh, three is lifelong learning, which is the era that um, we're working towards now, the knowledge revolution. OK, so number one, uh, the printing press in the apprenticeship era um, was a very big deal because it was able to uh, help with widespread development and diffusion of knowledge. The American Revolution and Industrial Revolution played foundational roles in what 
and how people learned. And apprenticeship focused on learning skills at home or in working environments to prepare the student for a specific trade. Moving on to the schooling era, that's the era that I grew up in. Um, that's education in the United States has roots from the European system and those foundations. This evolved to the universal schooling model championed by Horace Mann, shifting the responsibility of education from family in the apprentice role to the state. One room schoolhouses, which were multi age, uh, with close community connections, evolved to graded schools of separate age groups and abilities. Primary school teachers taught all subjects and secondary school teachers taught one subject as students rotated through the content areas. So that has to do with the five windows of the soul identified by William Torrey Harris in 1868, math, geography, literature and art, grammar and history. And then that um, allowed for the Morrill Act of 1862 to take place, and that helped establish public state universities specializing in agricultural sciences. Schooling is a model that works on achieving mastery of one grade and then matriculating to the next in age-centered groups. Okay, Horace Mann is mentioned uh, quite often in the book. And I've pulled a couple of quotes that were, you know, inspirational for that era and alluded to social justice. I feel that he was uh, one of the, you know, the educational uh, social justice fighters um, in, in early times in America. Okay, so then we, we have a foundational framework, right? And so moving ahead on how education is changing. Um, so as you know, thinking with computer tools, communication, enhanced capabilities of educating learners, just in time learning. So that's kind of doing research in real time to find out what you need when you need it. Uh, customization of learning. So, you know, working with individuals and finding that equity piece, giving learners control of what they want to learn and how they want to learn it in their own space and time, interacting with people either electronically or in person, uh, having recorded uh, information meetings or lessons, things like that. You know, scaffolding, one of our favorite terms in education, building on what we already know. Um, utilizing games and simula simulations as valid learning opportunities. Multimedia, so, you know, the, the, the composition of the old days of a of here's a paper I, I wrote from an encyclopedia I have at home to a, you know, now a current multimedia uh, conglomeration of PowerPoints and research and different components, slideshows, digital media, um, communicating and reflecting. As we know, a big piece of education is that that reflecting for our students. Um, so this is a picture of the Horace Mann School from 1900, and these are some of the barriers that the authors identified to technology use in schools. Um, so for instance, cost and access, and so these really have to do again with uh, social justice components, who can afford it, who is able to have the internet at home, um, or is their health, uh, health interest and food security that come into play. Um, classroom management, so how are we able to, in an online environment, support students um, in a sort of online classroom or different uh, delivery modality, Schoology and things like that. Um, so can computers teach everything that humans can? Uh, I think that if if people are if educators are well versed in their their lessons and are prepared that most everything can be absorbed by teachers as we're finding out in this emergency remote teaching world, uh, then there's the challenges to instruction. You know what sort of technology roadblocks are we going to have as educators and as teachers? Who's at home helping the students? Who's that home paraprofessional uh, helping students navigate not just the academics and the academic language, but also the um, the technology? Um, 
uh, is the microphone muted? All those pieces um, are things downloaded? Are they uploaded? Are they able to really thrive in this technology environment? Then there's the authority and teaching component. So that has to do with um, the different pieces of the of, of the education world, um, where power structures lay and who is responsible for that curriculum. And then there's those assessments that we're all learning more about um, regarding, you know, um, things like dibbles and progress and are, are, is that able to be done remotely? So those are some of the barriers that were identified by the authors. Um, so what the authors are basically stating is, the buildings are still going to be there. The teachers can work in the buildings or can work remotely, but we need to support a new seed that will grow the electronic environment for students to thrive in their own space and their own um, interests. OK, East High School in Denver. All right, so these new, uh, the seeds of this new system are looking at the current facilities that I just mentioned, going from there, not, not scrapping that idea of 100% online learning, uh, going to 100% online learning. Talking, they talk a little bit about educational programming and shows similar to, um, you know, PBS, uh, Sesame Street, um, Brain Pop, things like that. Um, so, uh, working with students from different backgrounds for content access, is everyone able to access things and take part as necessary? Um, working in the adaptive world and being cognizant of special needs learners, non-native English language speakers, and people that are just not able to get online. Um, one of the pieces, the components that they talk about as well is if, if that happens, that there should be um, online centers that schools have or districts have where um, students and families can go for resources. OK, oh, sorry. Um, and uh, the uh, instructional systems that are computer adapt adaptive, so getting students into things. I mentioned Schoology before. Um, Canvas was mentioned. Blackboard was mentioned in ways where education can be, um, you know, can thrive. And the maker spaces for people to be creative, learn different aspects. Now, the um, and the authors do state that just having one or two quote unquote computer classes in a high school may not be super beneficial to students because then they only think they think that those are the only things that you can do with computers. OK, so we want to have more of a holistic approach um, for them to have access to all as all aspects of technology. OK, oh, sorry, gosh. Third time here, how schools, all right, sorry, how schools can support new technologies. So this is sort of the, the big takeaways from the book. Um, the authors sort of break down a difference of old school, basically on that era number two, and new school, this era number three, and how they can work together. So for instance, the old school had uniform learning, but the new school has customization. The old school has teachers expert, the new school has diverse knowledge sources. The old school had standardized assessment, and the new school has specialization. The um, old school had knowledge in the head versus reliance on outside resources in the new era. Similarly, coverage, the old school versus the knowledge explosion. So going um, broad, but also learning a lot about content. Finally, there's the learning by acquisition versus learning by doing. And I believe we all are in, in this class and in this um, new world really embracing learning by doing okay so those are some of the pieces of the curriculum design and um, assessments and things like that all right moving ahead here so rethinking learning and what is important to learn so the authors talk about um, having more adaptable 
teachable, stackable certificates, hundreds of certificates that high school students can work towards for specialization in their interest fields. And maybe they'll graduate from high school and that'll be sufficient enough for them to have their career, or maybe they'll go ahead and move on to the college setting. So people um, you know, will develop those skills a little bit through elementary and middle school and really submerge in those in the, the high school grades. Um, similarly, the the interests um, can have an apprentice component, which is interesting because it sort of goes back to that original era of, you know, hands on learning. So I found that kind of fascinating as well. OK, um, and again, this has the equity equity piece that's very important. Um, some of this could be through homeschooling, through workplace learning. Um, doing distance education and continuing your whole life with adult education, um, getting into um, learning centers, having educational television and videos that I mentioned earlier, um, doing computer based learning environments um, and getting into those technical certificates. Um, so those are neat ways to think about their concepts. OK, a couple of uh, quotes that caught my attention from Horace Mann. Uh, you can read those on your own. Definitely some social justice components there talking about um, ideas as phenomenon. OK, and now finally, I'd like to um, you know, leave you with rethinking educational leadership. Um, it's been neat to get to know all of you in our course, and I feel that um, hopefully we're all educational leaders and we're doing our lifelong learning. So we are in the, the third era ourselves, uh, rethinking educational leadership. Um, so this is those visions of what does the future look like? And in 2018, when this book was published, was was foundationally the same, but with the urgency that we're now all in, I feel that these are coming to the forefront of policy decisions at the federal, state, local, and district levels. Um, even as simple, well, not as simple, but but even as foundational as you know, remote learning versus in-person learning now in the era of COVID. Okay, so obviously we want to promote policies that put computing and online classes in the hands of all students and families. We want to integrate things that don't have to do with school into learning environments. Uh, again, that can be you know different online learning activities, um, components, digital photography, and things like that. Supporting families. Um, you know, maybe with a family that might be a non-native English language family might have food insecurity and may also have special needs. Um, and then, you know, supporting them in an online facilitated uh, fashion, which is sort of a new, um, again, a, a new direction that, that is challenging for districts and schools. Um, ha schools having learning counselors that are able to support students and teachers with goals for individuals. Um, understanding those technical affordances and watch for any opportunities for to implement them. And then finally, a uh, thought to leave you with is a new Horace Mann for the new education system. And perhaps that'll be a, um, uh, uh, group think or ideas where we're able to take our practices that we're learning in social justice and implement them to society with equity, citizenship and social cohesion, diversity, um, thinking about broader horizons, um, engaging um, as much as possible, uh, less competition, you know, again, customizing the learning, having responsible learning, and um, not worrying too much about peer culture. So um, I thank you very much for um, enjoying, hopefully enjoying my, my PowerPoint. Um, I thank you for your time today as I've done my book review, my book trailer. Um, it was a, a fascinating book. Through, through the book, I, I feel that I wish I would have read it a few years ago or that it would be updated for now because these authors are amazing. Um, they uh, have been involved in different um, 
you know, uh, federal leadership roles and our professors at Northwestern and Harvard. So um, thank you so much for your time and I'll look forward to our discussion next. Have a great day. Thanks everybody. Bye.